All right. So uh, as is usual, um, if you can hear me, can you put something in the chat? Excellent. Thanks very much. Appreciate that. Um, meeting is being recorded, which is uh, good for me. Um, so, uh, so yeah. So let's just get right into it here. So what we've we're going to continue talking about indifference curves uh, today, um, which um, and we're going to try to sort of understand if I were to kind of go back, I think, to the cartoon that I've got here. Um, we, uh, by the end of today, hopefully we'll understand more about where this shape comes from and where other shapes might come from. And so that's kind of where we thought, where we ended last time. And so this uh, general sections, we're kind of going kind of slow through um, this whole unit is about kind of um, making sure we really understand indifference curves and these multi-commodity utility functions and then how those translate into things like demand curves uh, or marginal benefit uh, curves and things like that. And so um, getting from utility to demand is ultimately what we are trying to do um, here in this unit. And we really wanna make sure we understand the difference and all that because behind the scenes, when we talk about things like uh, demand has increased for whatever, a lot of people know like what that um, you know, mathematically might look like in the terms of some demand curve that maybe they learned about in microeconomics. But when I actually ask somebody, what does that mean for you know what actually happened to cause demand to increase? And it really needs to go back to a utility explanation. So that's what we're trying to build up here is that idea of what's the relationship between this term demand, which we will go into in great more detail later, um, and utility and indifference. So uh, yeah, so we've been talking, this is kind of this utilitarian perspective. Whoa, my scroll wheel, apologize for that. Um, that, uh, you know, utility, it's all about finding a way to quantify um, the costs and benefits at an individual level and at a society level. And we're focusing on the individual level here. And this is mainly coming out of Burke and Helfand, which is this chapter, which um, next lecture is lecture B4. So this short canvas activity that guides you through that chapter is due before the next lecture, lecture B4. So read through that chapter. It's a chapter provided on campus or on Canvas, and it also goes through just like we've been doing in difference curves all the way up through demand. So several of you have already submitted that. Great. Um, so that's just a reminder for those who haven't. So um, last time we ended up with a question, this question, what would indifference curves look like if the utility of a bundle was its cost? A lot of people get confused between the price of a good or price of a commodity and the utility that commodity brings them. Um, and what we're hoping that eventually get to the point is where you'll, you'll feel that those two things are decoupled, that um, you know, this green blobby blob thing brings me a certain amount of joy and has a certain benefit, um, but that benefit is decoupled from its price. The price is how much sum I'm willing to pay for it. So if I spend a dollar on this, then hopefully it brings me more than a dollar's worth of benefit. If it brings me just a dollar's worth of benefit, then it's been an even trade. I could have kept that dollar. But I buy it not because it brings me a dollar's worth of benefit. I buy it because it brings me at least a dollar's worth of benefit. So the price is not something's utility. The price is what we're willing to exchange. And uh, But if the price was something's utility, if the only benefit I got from something was knowing how much it costs, what would my utility functions look like? And that's where we ended things last time in a kind of a long breakout room, which I didn't properly manage the time, and I apologize for that. Um, but um, what I'm, uh, people got to there's towards the end was that the budget constraint line when put on this surface, we know that the budget constraint line gives us hypothetical bundles that all have the same cost. And that cost is the budget. So if we came in with a budget of Y, then uh, Y divided by the price of one good tells me how much I can buy of that one good, or Y uh, divided by the price of the other good tells me how much I can buy of that other good. And anything along the line that connects them is a mixture of those two goods for the exact same dollar amount. So two points along this represent two bundles, two commodity bundles, two good bundles, two bundles of goods that both cost the same. So if we know that utility and cost are the same in this fictitious world, where when we buy things, the only joy we get out of them is knowing the price tag. 
then all of these things would have the same utility. And so, um, so that's, um, so these two things would have the same utility and thus the budget constraint line would be an indifference curve. So we found one indifference curve. So then the question was how, what do the rest of the indifference curves look like? Well, in this world, the rest of the indifference curves would be parallel to that budget constraint line. And so the idea here is that um, two bundles of the same color that are on the same line here have the same cost. And if they have the same cost, then in this world where we only get joy out of the price tag of things, then the cost um, uh, being equated will be identical to the utility being equated. And so this will be the indifference curve. And so we will be indifferent whether we have this mixture of good A and B or this mixture of good A and B because both of those mixtures cost the same. Now this mixture up here costs more. And so we like this mixture better but this mixture down here costs the same as this mixture up here. So these two, we get the same joy from, and so they're on the same indifference curve. So this is what the indifference curves look like when our um, utility is purely related to the cost or the price of a bundle. Are there questions about that? Or does that make sense before we get into um, more advanced curves? This is what straight line curves. Now, not any straight line curve. So there was, um, I, I remember in the breakout rooms, people were not, they, they came up with the idea that these would be straight line curves, but some people were not sure whether they would be intersecting with the budget constraint line or parallel to the budget constraint line. And we can have straight line curves, but, um, but if the, those lines correspond to prices, then they're parallel to the budget constraint line because the budget constraint line is constructed based on a single price, the budget. Um, so um, if there were straight lines here that were that intersected the budget constraint line, then those indifference curves would not be based on price. They'd be based on something else. But so straight lines that are parallel to the budget constraint line are indifference curves where your only joy comes from the price tag of the bundle. So there are questions about that. Does that seem pretty clear? Okay. All right, so let's um, then, um, I actually didn't mean to give the answer to this away at the top of the slide. That was supposed to be animated away, but I think I uh, or didn't end up hitting shift when I was making this slide. So this was supposed to be a challenging question for you to think about here. What would indifference curves look like if we had a bundle that had both good A and good B in it, both commodities, A and B, both good A and good B, if we had a bundle that had both of them in there, but now we only cared about the price of, uh, or the amount or cost of good B, then we can ask what is, what do the indifference curves look like? And um, so again, I was gonna pose this to, to you all, but because I've given you the answer, then I'll just put it up there. And so the answer to this one is that they're horizontal lines. And so the, the reasoning here is if you take two bundles that are on the same line, they both have the same amount of good B in them. So we are indifferent to picking this bundle over this bundle because we are basing all of our decision making. All of our joy is based on the amount of B. We do not care how much A is in the bundle. So somebody could sell us a bundle, you know, it's kind of like, um, this is a great example. So the cable company forces um, me to buy upstream to you and uh, forces me to buy bundles of downstream speeds and upstream speeds. Now, in reality, I live in a house with my wife and my dog. My dog doesn't use a lot of cable. My wife and I usually use the internet at the same time. She's also a professor. And so um, we both have to worry about, um, you know, our, our upstreams, you know, if she's teaching her class at the same time as me, but our downstreams, we're probably watching the same TV at the same time. So, um, so the, the frustrating thing is that, that the price that the cable company puts on mixtures of upstream and downstream is pretty much based only on the downstream. 
but we really don't care about the downstream because all of the cable packages provided to us provide us enough downstream for our small family's needs. But the upstream is limiting. And so we effectively pay for upstream. So a cable company could give us, um, they could say your upstreams are all 10 megabit per second, but your downstreams are a bunch of different things. We would just pick the one that's cheapest because we only care about the upstream. We don't care about the downstream. That's kind of like what's going on here. You can imagine for us, good A is the downstream price and, or downstream amount. And good B is the downstream, uh, is the upstream amount. We in my house only care about the upstream. We only care about how much speed we have connecting our videos, our uh, web chats or whatever um, into the internet. And so this is our indifference curve. You know, I don't, you know, if, if you give me 10 megabit downstream or a gigabit downstream, as long as it has the same upstream, I don't really care. And so I would like to buy the one that's cheaper, um, but if you're limiting me um, to only one of those options, I'm gonna pick it regardless of what price you get. You know, so it's like, so it's like the, the value to me only depends on one thing, even though the bundle has two things in it. That's what's being shown here. Does that make sense in these indifference curves? Are there questions about that? This idea of the horizontal indifference curve means that you're buying two commodities, but you only care about one of the commodities in the bundle. Okay. So we can flip that and we can say, all right, um, what happens if I only cared about the other good, the other commodity in the bundle? And if I only cared about the other good in the bundle, then uh, I would get vertical because I don't care how much is in good B, but I care about good A. A lot of other people that don't do a lot of, uh, you know, web chat and things like that, Zoom and whatever, they may not care at all about the upstream. They might only care about the downstream. They're like, I got eight kids and they all want to uh, stream Netflix at the same time. I need as much downstream as possible. Give me all the downstream. I don't care about any of the upstream. And for that family, then maybe this is how things are. They're going to get both. So the cable company will be able to charge them for both. But even though the cable company charges them for both, they only care about one. They only care about the downstream. So that's kind of where we were meant to leave off um, last time. And so now, so before we get into the kind of more complex um, utility functions that motivate the rest of this lecture, then I want to make sure everybody is on board with this kind of, you know, these straight lines, you know, the, the oblique lines and the vertical lines and the horizontal lines and what those are representing. Does that make sense? Are there any questions? All right, so let's Let's take some guesses here. So, um, so let's um, do, uh, and I'm not going to bounce around to every breakout room, but let's do um, maybe a one minute breakout room or maybe a minute and a half. And, um, and to try to come up with, based on the discussion that I just had about diagonal lines, horizontal lines, and vertical lines, um, what do you think the utility function would look like for if your utility was based on whatever good in your bundle was overrepresented. So if I sold you um, a cable package and it had more downstream, then you would value that. But if I sold you a cable package that had more upstream, then you would put all your value on the upstream. So in this case, I give you a bundle, you ask which good is overrepresented, and then I'm going to assign a value to only that good. So if that was, the way you evaluated how you got joy from bundles, then what would indifference curves look like? This is a little more advanced. So I'm going to put you into breakout rooms, chat about that for about a minute, and then we'll come back and talk about it. So uh, that's here. I'll do, say, all right, we'll do that.
good. I can't hear you, Professor. No. How about now yeah we can hear you yeah we can okay. hear you now all right sorry ever since um a zoom update yesterday whenever i go back and forth from breakout rooms audio um for some reason cuts out and i have to do a bunch of machinations to get audio connected back up again um and so um hopefully all right it looks like i'm still over here oh, great so any ideas about this so what do we think that these look like So our group talked about how, um, based on like the line y equals x, whichever good is more represented would have it, it ends up looking like squares along that. Squares, well, okay, that's yeah, a cool like a, like a square because it's a combination. We talked about it as a combination of the horizontal lines and the vertical lines from the previous couple of discussions. I think that's a really cool idea. So you're saying that. Um, so I do have a question then. So if I were to um, let me do, I'll do a little PowerPoint annotation on top of here. So it sounds like you're saying there's some kind like, I heard you say something about a diagonal line. So if I were to picture like a diagonal line going up through here and then squares, and I, what I take what you mean by that is either something that looks, um, you know, it's maybe horizontal here and vertical here, or maybe vertical here and horizontal there. Um, it, am I taking to understand what you mean by kind of squares? Right, so we actually just took like the top of those two pieces, like choice one, that one, yes. And we just mm -hmm. took the, it's like two sides of a square, I guess. So not gotcha. Okay. And then just concentric ish ones of those. I see concentric, I like that term. So it's like circles made of squares, where like the, the center of the square is down here 
at that. All right. Anybody else have any other uh, answers that are sort of uh, uh, different than that? Or anybody else want a voice that they um, like? That I mean, does anybody have? Did anybody else come up with this same solution? And uh, maybe if I can, um, you can either say so in the chat, or maybe I'll bring the participants list back up. Hey, who would? Um, so I brought the participants list up. Who would vote for this solution? So you can click yes at the in your participants list. All right, I see a couple of yeses. And if you would vote for a different, if you have a different answer, then you can vote no. And that would tell me that you came up with something else. All right, I've seen, um, I saw initially uh, a couple of reds that then turned green. So that was interesting to see that kind of deliberation happen in real time. That was exciting. All right, so far all greens. I like this solution too. Let's see what how I did this. So I also drew an equal representation line. Um, and then that told me that in this space, there would be more of good A. And, um, and so if I'm interested in the over representation, then that would kind of tell me that I need to base my utility on um, just good A over here. Now, what I remember from the last couple of slides is that if I base my utility on just what's in good A, then if I've got a bundle here, then its utility is just whatever amount of good A is in. If I have a bundle here or here, its utility is just whatever amount of good A is in it. So it does kind of tell me that in this region, all of my utilities are probably going to be um, in the vertical position. But then, in up here, more of good B, then I'm saying that if I picked a bundle here, then its utility is based on how much is in, how much B is in it. A utility, a bundle here, its utility is based on how much of B is in it. So it kind of gives me the hint that over here, all of my indifference curves are going to be horizontal. So that is exactly what it sounds like we've been suggested by this answer. And so I agree, I would, I would say that the indifference curves here would kind of look like concentric squares. I love that term. They're like, you know, circles made of squares that are radiating out from the origin. And so this indifference curve, I would, I would say is a, a indifference curve of value 10. So what that means is that points along this indifference curve either have 10 units of B or 10 units of A. And in the left-hand side, when it's horizontal, they've got the 10 units of B. And when the right-hand side where it's vertical, they've got the 10 units of A. And so along all of the bundles along here are only being evaluated by their overrepresented component. And that's why it kind of looks like the edges of a square. And so, um, you can view this view more mathematically is if I view the bundle as a number, an amount of A, an amount of B, then the value, the happiness I get from this bundle is the maximum amount of A and B. And so all of the bundles along this line have the property that if you take the maximum amount of A and B, it's going to be equal to 10. And so um, if I were to, um, to kind of keep going with this, then my indifference curves look like, again, concentric squares. So it's as if there are squares that are centered on the origin and they radiate out like steps. And so um, there is this ridge of this, um, of this, I mean, really you can think of this as two ramps with a fold in the middle of it. And I've got this ramp that's going up this direction and this ramp that's going up this direction. And there's kind of a ridge that's in between them. And so any bundle on this uh, utility function is equivalent in um, utility as the bundle that's also on that indifference curve. And the way they're equal is that they both have a maximum number of eight in between the A and the B. So in the cable uh, example, if I only cared about um, maximum bandwidth, I didn't care if it was upstream or, or downstream, then this would be like 10 megabits per second on either my upstream or my downstream. 
and this would be eight megabits per second on either my upstream or my downstream. All right. So there are questions about that, about this, where we get this funny shape. Because what we're going to basically be doing in this class today is figuring out how to round these things off so that we can better understand where we get these even more complex utility functions. Um, and I see some comments here. Um, our group had similar thoughts. Excellent. Glad to hear that. That's very similar to what they were thinking of. Good. Good. Anybody have questions about this who maybe didn't get that or doesn't see where that's coming from? Um, so the graph, I see a question here. So the graph will have both lines, even if good B is overrepresented. Um, so I, I guess what you mean by both lines is, um, is they both have the horizontal and the vertical. And the idea here is that the, this thick black line here, the whole line represents, an, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll get to the next question for Madeline in a second. This whole thick black line represents all of the different ways I could mix good A and good B and still value them the same. And so I'm saying that, that all of the goods along this top black line are ones that I value with 10 units of utility. So if that's how much I'm willing to pay, you could say I'd be willing to pay $10 for any of these um, options along this black line. And the way I came up with that $10 is I looked for what is the maximum amount across the two goods. And so this line represents that when there's more of group good B, then I base that $10 only on the amount of good B. Over here, on the vertical side of things, when there's more of good A, then I base how I value that bundle in terms of only on what is in uh, good, uh, only the amount of good A in the bundle. But this represents all of the bundles that I would be willing to buy for $10. For you know, or where I'm using ten dollars as like uh, the, the like if something were if I'm willing to pay eleven dollars, it has more utility to me than when I'm willing to pay ten dollars. And so how I assign my willingness to pay um, ends up being diagrammed by these lines. And so related to that, can I go over how this applies to the downstream upstream? So if I viewed good A as my downstream from Cox or whoever my cable company is and I viewed good B as my upstream, then when I buy a cable package, which is not surprisingly called a bundle, I'm forced to buy a certain amount of upstream and a certain amount of downstream. So this bundle right here has a certain amount of downstream in it, and it has a certain amount of upstream in it. Now, um, if I, for whatever reason, when I look at uh, my options, I might be excited by whatever number is higher. So Cox could say, we're willing to sell you a bunch of different um, options. Which do you want to buy? And I need to sort them in terms of what I'm more excited about. If I'm most excited about the bigger number, then I'm only going to focus on the bigger number. And my indifference curves would look like this. In other words, if Cox gave me a bunch of choices that had um, you know, this vertical line represents all of the choices Cox could give me that have a downstream of, say, 10 megabits per second. And it doesn't matter what their upstream is. But at the instant the upstream gets bigger than 10, then it starts mattering what the upstream is. And so in order, so, uh, so that combines those bundles over here with these are all of the bundles that have a bigger upstream than downstream and their upstream is going to be equal to 10 and their downstream is going to be less than 10. So that's kind of one way to look at this is that the horizontal line here is when the upstream is equal to 10. So that's the upstream is equal to 10, but the downstream is less than 10. And then all of these bundles are when the downstream is equal to 10, but the upstream is less than 10. And me as a customer that only cares about the highest number, I will be willing to pay the same amount for anything on that edge of the line. Does that clarify things for people? Or are there more questions about that, about how to interpret these concentric squares? Great term. Madeline, do you have further questions? OK, OK, great. All right, so let's see where we go from here. Um, so 
Um, this concentric squares is probably a little weird. Like it's probably the case that somebody doesn't actually focus on just the maximum amount. Um, there's probably a smoother transition from getting more of one good to another. So what we often can think of is like, this is like a conceptual model for, um, for maybe the case where you generally focus on whatever good is an overrepresentation, but, um, but we're kind of like, we don't really care what happens uh, at this diagonal. And so like our mental model, we're really focused more on what's happening out here and out here. And we're not focusing so much on getting the details right here. And so really they're not concentric squares, they're really more like concentric ovals or concentric circles or something like that. And so really this square utility function might just be a way for our wrap, to wrap our heads around something that looks more like concentric circles, which is what we're shown here. This utility function has a lot of the same features of that kind of concentric square utility function, but now the indifference curves are curved which allows for a smoother transition as you go from bundles where you've got an, uh, an overrepresentation of B to an overrepresentation of A. And so as you get more of A, then your kind of focus on B becomes slightly less. But still, um, if we were to draw a diagonal line here, then it tends to be that bundles on this side of the diagonal line are ones where you're putting more of your joy into good B and bundles on this side of the diagonal line, you're putting more of your joy into good A and you have equal joy for equal goods right at the middle. And that's where this marginal rate of substitution is gonna come into play. So we mentioned that the marginal rate of substitution is kind of a way how much you're willing to trade of one good for another. So if we think about up here where things are flat so the marginal rate of substitution is gonna be low and we'll see that come out. I'll, I'll make that formal in a, in a second here. Then we find out that, um, that here, because this is a pretty flat sloped out here, then we have, there we have so little A that everything depends on B. So we are focusing all our effort on B because for this utility structure, we kind of are more interested in the things that we have more of and we have a lot more of B, so we're only focusing on B. But in this utility structure, if I do switch that, and now I get a lot more of A and very little B, then in this utility structure, I'm saying that I am going to put all my joy into how much A I have, and so I've got a nearly vertical slope here. But then in the middle here, then the, the slope of this line is 45 degrees, and so because that slope is equal to one, I'm kind of equally care about good A versus good B. So you can again view these as willingness to pay if that sort of helps there. And we'll get into more about that in a second. And so, um, and then there's intermediate versions of that. So this allows us to then talk about the marginal rate of substitution, which we introduced a couple lectures ago. And this is the slope along the indifference curve. It's how much of B that I'm willing to give up for one unit of A. If I have the psychology that I only care, that I care more about things that are overrepresented in my, like let's say I'm a collector. If I am a stamp collector, um, I've decided to become a stamp collector and it would be dumb for me to suddenly switch to become a baseball card collector once I have a whole lot of stamps. So once I'm all in for stamp collecting, then pretty much I only care about stamps and I'm gonna put a high value on stamps. If somebody offers me a box that has baseball cards and stamps in it, I'm only gonna look at the stamps because I'm a stamp collector. Now a baseball card collector, they've gone all in on baseball cards. If you offer them a box that has baseball cards and stamps, they're only gonna pay attention to the baseball cards. Now, if you've got a little bit of both, then you might say, you know what, I'm willing to collect both things. So you look at that box and you mix the two of them. That type of utility function is what we're modeling with these concentric circles. And the specialization on one or the other is what we're modeling with these MRSs, which are these slopes along these utility functions. So, um, and so if I you know, go up here, this is my stamp collector. My stamp collector, there's a low slope here because like, so let's say these are stamps. So that's my stamp collector. So this good is stamps. 
and you give me a box that has stamps and baseball cards, and then these are cards. So if you give me a box that has stamps and baseball cards, then I am going to, I might look a little bit at the cards, but I'm pretty much only going to look at the stamps. But if I am a baseball card collector, you give me a box of stamps and a box of baseball cards, and I only look at the baseball cards. If I've kind of had a healthy collection, you know, I've been collecting both, then um, I will probably, then I will live in this world where I will own both. And so my value of the next box that you offer me, I will put an equal value on the stamps or the baseball cards. So I will, I'd be willing to take either one of them. And that's kind of what that we're modeling here with the circular as opposed to square shaped utility functions. All right. So are there questions about this? What it means to have circular utility functions is that you're putting a value on the thing you have more of, but um, as you get equal parts of both things, then your value starts to become equal. And so this often represents how people specialize. So people who uh, choose their specializations, specialty often falls along these circular utility functions, because these circular utility functions um, represent that as you get more and more, it's kind of a rich get richer type of thing, is that once you get more of one thing, you start devaluing the thing that you don't have, and then you become a specialist, and you focus just on that. Okay. All right. All right, so um, if so, you know, so we, we look at these utility functions here, and I've kind of given a little bit of this away. Um, if we live in a world, or if we are dealing with a set of goods for which these are the utility functions, would you say that each good has an accelerating marginal utility? In other words, the good gets even better the more you have of it. Or would you say that these goods have a diminishing marginal utility, in which case the goods get less and less exciting as you get more of them? So just put in the chat what you think your answer would be. If this is your utility function, if we are dealing with a type of a set of goods for which we value them along indifference curves that look like quarter circles, then does this be diminishing marginal utility or accelerating marginal utility? seeing a lot of diminishing, no accelerating. Both, interesting, now I'm seeing accelerating. So I'm just going to let a couple more answers come in, see where our distribution of answers is. All right, I see a lot of answers for um, diminishing and a couple of answers for accelerating. Um, would some, uh, just because it's in the minority, I'm not gonna say which one it is right now, but just because it's in the minority, would some brave soul be willing to justify why they chose accelerating since that's in the minority opinion? Anybody? Go ahead. Okay, so I think it's accelerating marginal utility because the slopes get steeper as you get closer to one of the good so like for example on the outer concentric circle actually on any of them as you get further along on the x-axis you get more of the good x i think but i might be doing that backward which totally might be why more people are saying diminishing i i think you're so the reasoning there sounds like as you're moving along the x-axis then if we're looking at the slopes of these utility functions they're getting steeper and steeper. Did I understand your, was that what you were saying? Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. Does anybody have a, does, does anybody from the diminishing side want to, to justify why they said diminishing and why that's not a compelling answer? How many people said diminishing because, and you can maybe, I'll, I'll clear the answers here. How many people said diminishing because we've talked most about diminishing marginal returns so far? No judgment. I'm just uh, so nobody nobody's said diminishing because it sounded more familiar. All right. All right. Well, I actually really like 
that accelerating, um, uh, that, that, that explanation for why it is accelerating uh, marginal returns is that, um, and by the way, I did see in the anonymous uh, question, someone said that they um, uh, needed another example. I'm sorry, I didn't see that three minutes ago when you posted that. Um, so hopefully, um, but at the end of the lecture, um, if you still have a question, feel free to post that and, um, and I can see if I can try to populate more examples as we go on. So, um, so th that explanation about the, how the MRS is getting steeper and steeper is a great way to view it. The other way to view it is, again, I was saying that this is, these utility functions are what go on in the mind of a collector choosing what they're going to collect. Someone who has not decided what they want to collect could collect anything. It doesn't really matter. Um, but then as they start collecting more of one thing, then they want even more of that thing. And so those are accelerating marginal returns. And so what we're going to see here is that the MRS um, near the axis becomes steeper and steeper. And what that's representing is that they get sort of vertical here, is that as you move along the x-axis here, then your, whereas when you have hardly any of either good, then you almost have, you know, the MRS is basically a 45 degree line. It's equal to one. You'd be willing to trade one for the other. But now as we're moving along this axis with good A, then as we get more of good A, we are willing to trade more of good B for more of good A. So in other words, we don't want to give up any good A, but we are happy to give up good B to give up, to get more of our good A. And so if I, we think of our uh, MRS as delta B over delta A, then if this thing goes vertical, then that's like being equal to infinity here. And that means you're willing to give up all of your B for just a little bit of your A. And so that means you really, really care about A. So as you get more of A, you want more of A. And that would, to me, would be accelerating marginal returns. So that is when you see these concentric circles, when it's concave, then that represents accelerating marginal returns. And that goes for both um, the examples of, um, for both good A and good B. So if you see concave indifference curves, then that means that both goods have accelerating marginal returns. And this is what you'd expect someone choosing a specialization. Once they get good at that, they want to become more, um, increase more along that dimension. And so they have accelerating returns. That's where concave utility functions come up with. So then the question would be is if I did have diminishing marginal returns, what would those utility functions look like? And those are the ones that I'll just say for, for time are the ones that we more commonly see and they have that convex shape. So they bend the other way, and that's what we're going to see here. So if we think about that in the extreme case, what um, diminishing marginal returns is like conceptually is when you only value the thing you have less of. So when you hear someone say diminishing marginal returns, what they're saying is that look at all of your assets, and the asset that you have the least of, that's the thing you value the most because you don't have much of it. And so if we were to sort of do the same exercise we did at the beginning of the lecture, we can say, what do the utility functions look like? And they're going to look similar to the utility function, the indifference curves that we drew earlier, but they're going to sort of be flipped in that instead of being concentric squares, they're going to sort of be like, it's almost like they're concentric squares where the center is way off at infinity. And so they're going to be like these L-shaped ones. And so this indifference curve right here represents all the bundles of equal value. And we've judged the value of those bundles by the thing that they're, the good that is least represented in the bundle. And so all of these bundles happen to have the same amount of the least represented part of the good. So in all of these bundles, the smallest good is 10. And so the other good is more than 10. That's what all of these bundles are. Any bundle you pick here, that will be the property of it. And so um, it's equivalent to saying we have a utility function equal to the minimum of all our goods. And so we can draw all of the indifference curves together and we get something that looks like this. And so 
this is again representing the extreme case where you put all of your value into the one good you have the least of. Now in reality, it's much more complicated than that. You actually do value all of your goods that you own, but you might just weigh your value so that you have more value toward the ones that you have least of. So if, um, if you only have one car, it's really important that that car is operating you know, functionally and you've got gas for the car and all that sort of thing. But if you have two cars, you've now got redundancy. And so maybe you don't run as quickly to go to the gas pump or things like that. Or, or maybe you, know, you don't wanna buy a third car because you already got two cars and you know, a third car doesn't add any value to your life. And so you start spending money on other things. You know, it's like, so like, all right, well maybe I'll spend money on a home renovation or something like that, you know? So your value shifts towards the things you have less of. And that if you're willing to buy that these funny, um, you know, functions here, these indifference curves represent putting all of your value into the one good you have less of, then you can bu hopefully buy that the more realistic case is this kind of smoothed out version of that, where this is kind of a smoothed out version of those different curves where I just kind of put um, a rounded edge on all those curves from the previous slide. And these, this is the typical shape of diminishing marginal returns. So we, um, the, if I think about my MRS, the MRS starts steep and then it gets shallow. So when, if I think of the MRS as delta B over delta A, then up here, the MRS is equal to infinity and down here, the MRS is equal to zero. So when I have hardly any A, that is when I'm willing to give up all of B. So that's what the infinity means. For even a little bit of A, I'm, I'll give you all my B. And I do that because I have so little of A. On this other side, when the MRS is equal to zero, then that's saying that I have so little of B that I won't give you any of my B, but I will take as much A as you'll give me. So in that case, um, uh, you know, you can give me a whole lot of A and I just don't care about it. Um, I'm not willing to give up any of my B. So, um, or to put another way, um, I have so little B that um, I will give you all of my A in order to get just a little bit of B. So this MRS is, is effectively the, the barter rate for B and A together. All right. So are there questions about that? So I'm just graphically showing that here. So our steep MRS means I'm willing to give up a lot of B to get a little bit of A, and that's because I have less A than B. But then the shallow MRS, when I have more A than B, then I'm willing to give up a lot of A to get a little bit of B because I have less of the B. And then if somewhere in between, uh, when I have equal parts of those, then it's an equal trade. Because I have an equal number of A and B, if you, um, I'm, if you give me a new A or a new B, then I'm willing to give you one of my A, but it's an equal trade because I have an equal number of them. So I value them equally. So that's what diminishing marginal returns look like when you put it in this multi-commodity framework. So are there questions about that? Diminishing slope being diminishing utility diminishing marginal utility. Questions? This is very abstract. You know, a, a good goal of all this would be if you can, if you can come out of this week and you look at convex and concave and be able to make sense in your mind of how you go from accelerating returns in concave to diminishing returns in convex, then you are in great shape. You know, then you've got a conceptual and internal model of what these indifference curve shapes mean. And in a real world, we can ask people how much they're willing to trade. And, um, and if we ask a stamp collector how many stamps they're willing to trade for a baseball card, they'll say, no, I'm not going to trade it. I don't want baseball cards. I only like stamps. And so then we would end up um, you know, we could, we could say, okay, what if I give you a million baseball cards? And they could say, wow, you know, if you gave me a million baseball cards, I could become a baseball card collector. So finally, we've reached the trading. And so we could finally quantify the steepness of these slopes. And so we can, by surveying people, we can actually come up 
with approximations of their indifference curves. And we can draw this multi-commodity utility space using surveys from real people by asking them how much they're willing to trade. So any other questions? I like to give about 30 seconds when I ask for serious questions because it usually takes about that amount of time for people to build up the courage. Okay. All right. So um, the thing that we've left out so far is um, how do you go from how much you value to how much you're willing to spend in a market where other people have put a dollar amount on the things that they own? So, so far I've talked about in a purely barter economy, no money, just how much you're willing to, you know, this green blob for this coffee cup, how many green, well, they both kind of disappeared if we both put them here maybe. So how many green blobs am I willing to trade for um, cream colored coffee cups? That's like the MRS. But in reality, green blobs have a price tag and coffee cups have a price tag. So how do I combine my utility with the price of things in the real world? That's where we're going with this now. And so there are two ratios that are gonna be very important to us. One of them is the marginal rate of substitution. How much are you willing to trade of one good for another? But the other thing is the price ratio of those two goods. And so um, the idea here is that the, um, this is sort of how much I psychologically value something, B versus A, and this is how much the market values something, A versus B, or B versus A, but the, the, because of the way how prices work, then um, which one's in the numerator kind of changes, but if you think about it, if this ratio, if this is high, so if this is a large number, then that means the price of A is much greater than the price of B. And that means that the market really values A more than the market values B. But over here, if this is large, then that would mean that I am willing to give away a lot of B to get even a little bit of A. So both of these would indicate that I value A more and the market values A more but just the way that prices work, then in order for us to sort of quantify the relative value to the market, we have to divide the price of A by the price of B. But in order to, to measure in a barter economy what the value of A is, I need to say the amount I've been willing to trade a B divided by A. That's why the A's and B's appear to switch. But both of these can be viewed as representing the relative value of A versus B. Um, one in terms of my psychology and the other one in terms of market prices. And so it maybe won't be surprising that we will end up making our choices of how we stock our goods so that these things will end up coming into um, equal each other. So we can rearrange our goods because um, there's going to be times when the market values a good more than we do and we value a good more than the market does. And it sets up these kind of arbitrage conditions where it gives us an opportunity to sell some of our stuff and buy some of their stuff so that we end up bringing our relative values into a line alignment. So, um, and so that's kind of what we're going to be talking about here. So um, let's introduce the budget line one more time. And, um, and so the question here is if I give you a budget constraint line and you know, I have a good A here and good B here. And let's say I also gave you two prices, the price of good B and the price of good A. Now, without me telling you the prices, just with showing you this line, um, how many people think that um, good B, or let's say, actually just maybe put into the chat, which one of these two do you think is cheaper? If I show you this budget constraint line here, per unit, which one of these things do you think is cheaper, A or B? And you can just put your answer into the chat. Okay, seeing a lot of answers. High confidence in B, I think, so far. I haven't seen any answers for A yet. All right, good. So would any brave soul like to justify why they thought that B was cheaper? Either in the chat, in the chat 
Go ahead. Um, because you can buy more of B for the price that you have available. Because if you're if you're looking at that graph, it's way higher, which means the number of items is higher for the amount of value, right? The number you have, the amount you have. Yeah. So, um, so I think that's an that's an excellent answer, and that answer was echoed in the chat um, as well. And so, if we look at this this budget, so if we go all the way to the axes, then when the budget constraint line intersects, where if you were to put your whole budget into buying one good, how much could you buy of it? And clearly, we can buy with this budget a lot more of B than we can of A, and that tells me that per unit, then uh, then B is cheaper. So. Um, so that's all we're saying here. The same budget can buy more of B than A, and so we know that um, B is cheaper. So if I think about the slope of the budget constraint line, this slope um, is going to be the price of A divided by B, the price of B. And so this is a steep slope, and so this is a large number. So this slope here is large, and that corresponds to the price of A being um, higher, which means that the market values A more than it values B. And so large slopes of the budget constraint line mean higher prices for the horizontal axis, for the good that's down here. Steep slope, price of A is greater than price of B. Now, let's say I put diminishing marginal utility curves over here. This is how I value um, these two goods relative to each other. And then I also put that budget constraint line. And so um, we've talked about, you know, this, like where I'm going to put um, my, uh, my effort or where I'm going to, to buy things. And, and we said, well, you know, anything above the budget constraint line is not feasible because none of these bundles I can afford. I can only afford bundles within the budget set, which is under the budget constraint line. So none of these work but I have to choose among bundles that are down here, that are beneath the budget constraint line. And so of all of those bundles, I wanna choose the bundle that maximizes my utility. I wanna choose the bundle that ends up being on the highest indifference curve. And the point of tangency between an indifference curve and the budget constraint line, when for goods that have diminishing marginal returns, ends up telling me my utility maximizing choice. This is the best way that I can distribute my resources. I could buy this much of A and I could buy this much of B, this much downstream and this much upstream or something like that. Um, and that's based on my utility. This is gonna maximize my utility is by choosing that bundle. And so um, if we, that's kind of all that I'm saying here now, um, if we think about this, the slope of my indifference curve, which is my marginal rate of substitution, happens to be equal to the slope of the budget constraint line. So I'll say that's the budget constraint line slope, so the BCL, budget constraint line. So that is a key point here is that at the point of tangency, at the utility maximizing bundle, the indifference curve slope, the marginal rate of substitution, equals the ratio of the prices. So one way you can view this, if you're looking for a way to kind of reason through this, is that at this condition, you can cross multiply. And you can sort of say that, all right, well, if I were to trade a little bit of B, I would sell that B at the price of B, and then I could take that money, and then I would spend the price of A to buy a little bit more of the A. And when these two things are equal, then there's no beneficial way that I can change my position by buying and selling those two goods. Because I already kind of, um, like I kind of agree with the market on the relative value of these things. So I can't buy, I can't sell a bunch of A and buy B and suddenly be on a higher utility curve or sell a bunch of B and buy A and be on a higher utility curve. Because right now, if I sell a little bit of B at the price of B, um, then if I buy some A, I'm actually gonna be worse off and I'm just gonna wanna buy my B back. So this um, is the so-called equimarginal principle 
and it is when the marginal rate of substitution is going to be equal to the price ratio of these two goods. And so the marginal value of our, in our psychology is going to match the kind of marginal value to the market is the so-called equimarginal principle. All right, I see a nice in the chat. I appreciate that feedback, thanks. I didn't come up with it. But this only applies to diminishing marginal utility. All right, so, um, so these curves that are convex. So um, just to kind of see this play out, you know, to further this example, if I happen to own this much of B and this much of A, then I can evaluate my marginal rate of substitution and I can evaluate um, how much the, um, the market cares. So on the, on the budget constraint line, the slope of the budget constraint line is how much the market cares and the slope of the indifference curve is how much I care. And because those slopes don't align, then that is going to tell me that the market values B more than I do. And so because the market wants B and I've got B, I'm gonna sell a lot of B. And as I sell B, then the amount of B that I have is gonna go down. And what am I gonna do? I'm gonna buy A. And if I buy A, the amount of A I am is gonna go up. And that's gonna slide me down the budget constraint line back toward the point of tangency. On the flip side, if, um, if I have a lot of A and little b, and I'm beneath this point of tangency, so the point of tangency is up here, then what that's going to tell me is that I, the market values A more than I do. And so I can sell A, get a bunch of money back, and buy B. And when I sell A, that's going to remove me down. And then when I buy B, that's going to move me up. And then the net effect is I'm going to move along the budget constraint line back towards the point of tangency. And so this equimarginal principle is just reflecting the fact that clever people are going to evaluate how much they value relative goods and how much the market values relative goods. And when the price is right, they're going to sell some of their goods and buy some other goods until the amount of goods that they have brings them to a space in their utility space where they are kind of okay to sit. They're saying, I'm not willing to sell anymore. I'm not willing to buy anymore. If I sell anymore or buy anymore, I'm not going to reach any higher utility. So that's this idea of the equimarginal principle. Okay. Are there questions about that? This idea of what um, of, uh, hopefully gives you a more conceptual feel as to where this point of tangency comes at. You can either think of it as a point of tangency or a better way to think of it is it is the point where the MRS, where the slope of the indifference curve happens to be collinear with the budget constraint line. So you end up choosing things until your marginal rate of substitution agrees with the budget constraint line. And at that point, you stop. Any questions about that? About 10 minutes left of class. Okay. All right, so let's stretch our minds just a little bit more those cases were for diminishing marginal returns. Now there are certain types of goods that don't have diminishing marginal returns. They might have constant um, marginal rate of substitutions. So um, this rare case might be that regardless of how much you own of A or B, you always value them relatively the same. So, um, you know, it's, um, it's, you know, it, it's like saying that, um, no matter how many coffee cups you have, you always value coffee cups and silverware relatively the same. That doesn't make any sense because if you had a million coffee cups, eventually you would rather prefer getting some silverware. But in the weird world where regardless of how many coffee cups you own, you're willing to trade the same number of silverware for a new coffee cup, this is what your indifference curves would look like. Now, if these indifference curves are shallower than the budget constraint line, which is over here, what do you think you might do? Where would you put your money? Would you put your money here? Would you put your money here? Maybe you put your money down here. 
Maybe you'd put your money up here. What choice maximizes your utility? So by yourselves, you know, like look at that for 10, 15 seconds. And then in the chat, um, give me a description of where you would put your money in this particular case. If your utility functions were all lines like this, constant marginal rate of substitutions, constant slopes, and this budget constraint line was steeper than your marginal rate of substitution, then where would you put your money? Would it be in a mixture of A and B? And if so, where? Or would it be all in A or all in B if you wanted to maximize your utility? So where would we put it? I guess I'm saying mixture or all in B or all in A. Anybody? We're almost done. I see mixture of both, to which the question was, ah, interesting question. Is this uh, maybe where personal preference come into play? The utility function um, is a model of your preferences, your personal preferences. So if these were your preferences, if this utility function matched your preferences, then um, where would you put? So first I saw all mixtures. The problem with that was saying mixture, then you have to say where, which mixture, because there's a bunch of mixtures. Now I'm seeing people say all B. Why all B? So, and you can put this in the chat if you'd like to, why would somebody um, only pick all B? Why not all A? Highest indifference curve is a question, is, is an answer that came out in the chat. Anybody else like that answer, highest indifference curve? Highest utility, I see some agreement. Highest utility, same budget. This is beautiful. That's exactly what I want you to be saying. You make choices to climb the indifference space, to climb the utility space. If you're stuck with these choices underneath here, the highest way that you can climb is to choose B, all B there. And that is where you would chose, choose. There is no way to make your MRS collinear with um, the, um, the budget constraint line. And so in that case, all you can do is put all of your options in B. So, um, so you basically think to yourself, I value B more and it's cheaper because the market likes A more. So I'm going to sell all my A and I'm going to buy all my B. And so that's what you end up doing there. Now, if they change the prices of things so that the budget constraint line now has um, much cheaper A, um, then I might um, say, well, you know what, I value um, B more and it's cheaper because the market likes B more. So then I sell all my B and buy all my A. And so in this budget constraint line, um, the value shifted and I shifted the other way. And you can see this is, again, the highest way I can reach or the best way to reach the highest indifference curve. So it's the relationship between these two. Now, in the last special case I want to throw out there just to kind of stretch your thinking, is, is if we go back to our accelerating marginal returns, well, then what the heck do we do? This is a special case where the equimarginal principle looks like it would apply, but it does not. You do not apply the equimarginal principle when you have accelerating marginal returns. Because if you did, you'd be stuck on this utility function because that's where the tangency is, even though you technically for the same money could have reached higher indifference curves, higher uh, amounts of utility. And so we do not want to pick the point of tangency when it's in accelerating uh, marginal returns. In the end, what we do for accelerating marginal returns is a so-called all or nothing solution. We look at both pure bundles, we have to evaluate both of them, and we pick the pure bundle with the highest utility. In this case, it happens to be pure B, and so we're going to choose pure B. So if some of you have heard about economies of scale, so when you have, let's say, pollution control, where there is an economy of scale, that means that as you, um, as you spend more to, um, to control pollution, it becomes cheaper to spend even more to control pollution. Well, in those particular cases, rather than coming up with an optimal you know, balance of exactly how much pollution you're gonna control, you're gonna just clean everything. So when you have economies of scale or when you have accelerating marginal returns, you specialize. And so you end up evaluating based on your budget, 
would I be better specializing on A or would I be better specializing on B? And then you look at those two options and rank them and then you choose all of one and nothing of the other. So accelerating marginal returns, all or nothing. Not equimarginal. Equimarginal is only diminishing marginal returns. All right. I think that's the last technical thing. Everything else here is just a reminder of what's coming up. Um, any questions? Yeah, so economies of scale, and we will talk more about economies of scale later. This is just a preview. An economy of scale is when, um, is when uh, so often in production, we talk about economies of scale. It costs a lot to make the first coffee cup. But once you make the first coffee cup, you have all of the materials you needed to make the first coffee cup. So the second coffee cup is cheaper to make. And maybe after you build two coffee cups, you get more, you get even better at building coffee cups. And then you can, the third one might be even cheaper to build. And then maybe eventually, um, uh, you know, other people start making coffee cups and, and there's all these other things that could happen so that the next coffee cup is always cheaper to build. In that case, it's a so-called an economy of scale. And so with um, a lot of things that we produce um, in major manufacturing, it's only really beneficial to sell millions of them because of economies of scale, because it's so expensive to sell one or two. But once you sell a thousand, then it actually, there's efficiencies you can capitalize on. So the next a thousand are cheaper than the first a thousand. And, um, and so that is closely related to these accelerating marginal returns is that um, once you have a lot of stamps, then it becomes um, even more beneficial to have more stamps. And so you may as well just go all out and just buy all stamps. And so if you have a certain budget and um, then stamps are cheaper for you and you're part of the world and you want to specialize in either stamps or baseball cards, then what this graph would suggest is you should specialize on stamps. Um, but um, if you're in a different part of the world where the budget constraint line goes the other way, then maybe then you should specialize on baseball cards. And that is also how we get different parts of the world specializing on different types of manufacturing because it's cheaper for certain types of the world um, to um, have different. So economies of scale are a manufacturing thing, but if it's cheaper to manufacture in general a certain thing in one country, that country will specialize on it and another country will specialize in the other one. And that's the combination of economies of scale um, and accelerated marginal returns and these slanted budget lines. Um, and that's the reason why there's only one or two electric companies in every city. Yeah, we could talk about all this and we will kind of get into this sort of things too, these economies of scale issues and stuff like that, how it relates to competition. All right, so, um, so if we had time, the looking ahead, I'm just gonna just, I'm gonna basically gonna go through these until the reminders, um, read the Burke and Helfen. So that's the stuff that's, and then you'll see that um, arguments about this electricity versus non-electricity. And she is going to start saying, well, what happens when we change the price? And that's what we're gonna talk about next time is what happens is we change the price. And that finally is gonna allow us to pivot into the so-called demand function. And so we are going to be able to draw a direct connection between indifference curves to demand functions. So demand functions, if you've ever taken a microeconomics course, you're probably familiar with these supply and demand. So here's your demand and then, uh, you know, supply, these demand curves. And we're finally going to introduce like the utility framework underneath where these demand curves come with so that we can start using demand curves and feel better about it. So that's what uh, we're going to be talking about. So this is just preview for next time. So um, uh, the reminders, uh, read the Burke and Helfand. There is a lecture activity. Uh, there is an attendance question coming up. Uh, next slide. Uh, next, uh, and so activity B4 is due before next lecture, before the next lecture, lecture B4. That is over the chapter that's provided from Burke and Helfand. That's on Canvas. And then looking ahead, if you're done with that, start reading chapter two back in the main textbook and uh, uh, activity C1 will be due before lecture C1, which is at least a week from now. So um, might even be a week and a half from now. So um, you can start reading it at that. So um, attendance exercise for today and uh, just post this URL here as I come up with one. And the question I have for today is what is a name for the principle 
that you will maximize your utility when your marginal rate of substitution matches the ratio of prices in the market. So we said there's a general rule or principle that has a fancy name that economists use. What is the name? So I'll put that in the chat. What is the name of the principle where maximal utility occurs for diminishing marginal utility where MRS matches the ratio of prices in the market. So there's a name for that. And what is the name for that? So you can submit that in your attendance exercise for this week and hit submit. And that's all I have for you today. I'll hang around for a few minutes if anybody has questions. Otherwise, you feel free to pop off. Great. Thanks for your attendance. Any questions from anybody else? Uh, concave or convex utility functions. Concave is like, like a cave. Again, feel free to hop off when you are uh, satisfied. And then I'll wait until a critical mass is reached and then end the meeting. Thanks I know for, it's for attendance, but I was wondering, could you say the answer to that question? Because I don't know the answer, which means I obviously like missed a key point. Sure, yeah, I mean, what the heck, yeah. Um, it's the equimarginal principle. Okay. So, you know, that's and I can actually put that in the chat for the equimarginal rule. Thank you. And just as a heads up in the textbook, they talk about the equimarginal principle as well. Um, it is all the same, although it shows up in a lot of different ways. And so it may not specifically say it's where the marginal rate of substitution equals the price ratio. But if you think it through, that's what it comes down to. It will always be where the um, marginal rate of substitution equals the price ratio. That's the equal marginal principle. Any other questions? No, thank you. Great. All right, in that case, I will end the meeting and uh, have a nice weekend, everybody. <laughs>